Thanks, Cynthia, and good morning, everyone. As uh, Cynthia mentioned in this next uh, presentation, I'll be addressing the topic of hotspots policing, which has been a particularly important policing innovation, I think, in recent years, uh, and stands out, I think, as one of the leading examples of an evidence-based policing strategy. The use of crime mapping to identify pockets of crime concentration to guide police operations is now very common among many police agencies. And we also have a good deal of evidence that geographically targeted police interventions are effective uh, in reducing crime. But questions still remain about the best strategies for police to use at hotspots and about how police can best implement and manage these efforts. So today I'd like to review some of the key findings from the hotspots policing research uh, and emphasize the use of patrol and problem solving at hotspots and discuss some of the ways that police might be able to maximize their uh, deterrence and crime prevention effects uh, at these locations. Now the term hotspots policing refers generally to police interventions focused on small areas or very specific places where crime is concentrated. There's no universally accepted definition of the term hotspot, but it's often used, particularly by researchers, to refer to very specific addresses, intersections, street blocks, and clusters of blocks where crime is concentrated. As Cynthia mentioned earlier uh, this morning, uh, studies in a number of cities have shown that about half of crime occurs at 5% or less of the addresses and street blocks uh, in a jurisdiction. And these places are often stable over time. So year after year, it may be the same places driving a lot of your crime problems. And these places can have a big impact on the overall crime trends in your jurisdiction. Now, these areas tend to be nodes for various business, leisure, and travel activities. In the words of what we call routine activities theory, they tend to bring together motivated offenders, suitable targets and an absence of capable guardians. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the crime triangle idea. Uh, this is what that refers to. These places tend to have uh, features and facilities that create criminal opportunities and criminogenic conditions. So examples include places where you find things like bars, convenience stores, apartment complexes, and the like. And so it's thought that police can be more effective and more efficient in a number of ways by focusing their efforts on these places. For one, you're concentrating on the places where crime is most likely to occur. Officers can also arguably generate um, a more visible presence and have greater perceptual effects in the small space of a hotspot than, say, over larger areas like a neighborhood or a patrol beat, uh, potentially maximizing their deterrent effects. Also, when you're focusing on these very specific places, it might be easier to identify very specific, tangible conditions that contribute to crime at these locations. And you might be able to uh, address those using prevention techniques like situational crime prevention, or perhaps working with uh, place managers at these locations, people who are running particular businesses or managing apartment complexes uh, and the like. We now have uh, several studies indicating in general that hotspots policing is effective. On this slide, you see results from one recent review uh, that looked at 19 hotspot studies that have been done as of 2010. In these studies, police have used a variety of different patrol and crackdown and problem solving interventions at hotspots. Uh, across these studies, the police were successful in reducing crime in 20 of the 25 tests uh, that were done. And also what they found is that when you reduce crime at these locations, you're not necessarily going to just move it around the corner to other nearby locations. In fact, what they find in these studies is that more often than not, you can reduce crime at the hotspot and often in the surrounding areas as well, what they refer to as a diffusion of crime control benefits. When you're thinking about the issue of displacement, keep in mind that hotspots are hotspots for a reason, because they have certain types of characteristics at those locations that attract crime or that, are, that help to facilitate crime in different ways. So for crime to be displaced, offenders have to find other areas that provide them with similar opportunities and areas where they feel comfortable uh, committing those offenses. So if dis displacement may not necessarily occur, if it does, it may not be complete. Uh, and at least uh, these studies indicate that it isn't necessarily just going to move it around the corner. Certainly that's something that you can monitor and keep an eye on, but uh, it's certainly not inevitable. So we know in general that hotspots policing is effective. 
So that said, I want to discuss some of the ways that you can try to incorporate this into your everyday operations, uh, again, focusing on patrol and problem solving. And I'll start by uh, discussing the issue of using everyday patrol at hotspots. And I'll discuss this first with reference to a, a famous study that was done in Minneapolis many years ago, the Minneapolis Hotspots Patrol Experiment. It was the first study to really look at the impacts of police interventions, in this case patrol, focused on these high-risk locations. It was a study done by Lauren Sherman and also David Weisberg, who's the executive director of the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy. And in that study, working with the Minneapolis Police Department, they started off by identifying 110 micro hotspots. These were small clusters of high crime addresses uh, defined in such a way that really each hotspot was basically an intersection and the blocks, uh, one or two blocks going in each direction. So they're pretty small, well-focused locations. And for a one-year period, they randomly assigned 55 of these locations to have intensified patrol. And so officers assigned to these locations were told to spend as much time as they could at these places in between calls for service. What they did there was up to them, but they just wanted there to be intensified patrol presence. So it amounted to intensified but intermittent uh, patrol presence throughout the day. Uh, at the other 55 locations, it was just uh, routine patrol as usual. And the study showed that uh, these extra patrols helped to reduce crime and disorder at those locations. This chart shows uh, changes in calls for service uh, over the one-year period. The red bars uh, denote the experimental locations where they were doing the extra patrols, and the blue bars represent what we call the control locations. That's where it was just business as normal, no extra patrol. As you can see, during this time period, uh, total calls for service and calls for what they called soft crime, more minor offenses like, say, vandalism, disorder, prostitution, and the like, those sorts of calls were going up in both sets of hotspots, but note that they went up much less in the experimental spots where they were getting the extra patrol than they did in the other set of locations. And if we look at calls about hard crime, these are more serious offenses, uh, they went down modestly about 7% uh, in the target areas while staying unchanged in the control areas. So this was the first study to demonstrate that by focusing patrol on these high-risk places, you could get uh, reductions in crime. Uh, which in some ways may seem unremarkable, but uh, keep in mind the context at that time, the conventional wisdom was that patrol had no effect on crime. And that was based on some uh, famous research that had been done back in the 70s. But this study said, no, it can be effective. You just need to focus it in the right places. Now, I later did some follow-up research with the Minneapolis data, and I was specifically interested in the issue of whether there's an optimal length of time for police to stop at a hot spot when they're doing their normal patrol activities. Of course, as a practical matter, you have to spread your resources across lots of different hot spots. You can't necessarily afford to have officers sitting in any one place for too long. Uh, officers may be resistant to that as well. So is there a way that we can maximize effectiveness and efficiency in spreading patrol resources across potentially a lot of different hot spots? So I did this by uh, analyzing data on approximately 17,000 instances when police had either driven through hotspots in Minneapolis or stopped at those locations, and also at looking, by looking at subsequent crime and disorderly behavior that occurred after they left the hotspot. Uh, I did this using uh, observational data that they had collected during the Minneapolis experiment. They actually, during that one year period, had observers going out to these different hotspots and recording the comings and goings of police. Uh, this was in the days before ADL, so they did this to make sure that the target locations were getting additional uh, patrol. And while they were there, they were also recording any type of criminal or disorderly behavior that uh, they witnessed. So I wanted to see if longer police stops at hotspots had greater effects on crime and disorder that occurred after they left the location, you know, what we can call a residual deterrent effect. You can, of course, expect that the police will have an effect on behavior while they're there, but what about after they leave? If they have a longer stop at the hot spot, for example, is that more likely to drive away uh, potentially troublesome persons from the location or uh, have a greater effect in moderating their behavior even after the police have left? But at the same time, I also wanted to see if there was a point of diminishing returns to this effect. Uh, is there a point at which it was just kind of excessive or, or overkill or not worthwhile for them to stay uh, any longer? Now, what I found uh, is represented in this graph where 
The bottom axis uh, along here represents the length of the police stop. And I was looking at drive-bys and police stops of up to 20 minutes in length. Uh, due to limitations of the data, I couldn't look at uh, longer police presences. This vertical axis here represents the effects of the police presence on crime and disorder after they left the hotspot. And essentially, a larger number represents a greater effect in reducing crime and disorder after they left. And what I found was that, uh, indeed, if the police stayed at the hotspot for a longer period of time, they did have a greater effect on, in reducing crime and disorder even after they left. If they stayed at the hotspot for at least 10 minutes, they generated significantly more residual deterrence than they did if they simply drove through the location. But I also found that if they stayed for longer than 15 minutes, that effect seemed to level off and even turn down a bit. So what this pattern suggests is that 14 to 15 minutes is the optimal length of time for police to sit on a hotspot <clears throat> during any particular patrol visit. Now, as Cynthia mentioned, over the years, uh, my colleagues have begun referring to this as the COPER curve. So if you hear COPER curve or the COPER hotspot strategy or COPER minutes or something like that, this is basically what they're referring to. I always say for the record, no, I did not name it after myself. Uh, I called it something a lot more bland, like dosage response curve or something. And my colleagues said, no, no, the Coper curve, that's, that's neater. And, and it's stuck, so, uh, so we go with it. To give you a more concrete sense of what this means, this chart shows the likelihood of some kind of criminal or disorderly behavior occurring within one of those hotspots in Minneapolis within 30 minutes of police leaving the hotspot. And this is contrasted for instances when they simply drove through the location in instances when they stayed for 11 to 15 minutes. As you can see, if they simply drove through the location, there was about a 16% chance of some kind of criminal or disorderly behavior occurring within 30 minutes. If they stopped for 11 to 15 minutes, that was reduced down to 4%. So you had a 75% reduction in the likelihood of some kind of short-term criminal uh, or disorderly behavior at the location. So the implications of this are that police can potentially maximize the deterrent effects of patrol by making proactive 10 to 15 minute stops uh, at these micro hotspots within their patrol areas on, uh, let's say, kind of a random intermittent basis throughout their shifts. And in principle, this might provide you with a way of trying to reorient your everyday patrol uh, around these hotspot locations. And more recently, this idea was put to the test in a study that was done in Sacramento, California. And in the next session, you'll be hearing from Sergeant Renee Mitchell from Sacramento PD, who was the main uh, architect behind this study. She'll talk about this in a lot more depth. But here, I'll just note that they, they did this study where they tried this. They assigned officers to particular hotspots. They told them to make 12 to 16 minute visits to these hotspots uh, roughly every two hours. They did this at 21 hotspot locations and compared what happened at those locations over 90 days to what happened at another 21 spots where it was just patrol as usual. Again, note that they did this with just normal, in the context of normal patrols. You didn't have any uh, overtime funding or any special units doing it. They were just trying to uh, work it into normal patrol. Uh, and they got very good results, as you can see in this chart here. Uh, the red bars represent the experimental locations where they were doing the extra patrols. Uh, calls for service went down around 10 or 11 percent. Uh, part one crimes went down 25 percent. Meanwhile, you can see that calls for service and crime were rising in the other uh, locations where they were not doing these uh, stops. So what this shows is just doing periodic 10 to 15 minute stops. Uh, at hotspots can be a, an effective way to reduce crime at these locations. This uh, model of doing these periodic short stops also may be a particularly efficient way to go. You can see that uh, by looking at this table that compares the results of the Minneapolis study to those in the Sacramento study. Now remember that in both of these studies, the treatment was essentially intensified but intermittent patrol. But in the Minneapolis study, they were telling officers to spend as much time as they could at these locations through the day. And in total, they were racking up around you know, two hours or more at these locations on a daily basis throughout most of the study. They weren't sitting there for two hours at a time, but if you added up the time they spent throughout the day, uh, it came out to two hours or more. But in the Sacramento study, because they were doing the shorter visits, 
it was more like three quarters of an hour to an hour in total daily dosage, yet they got stronger effects in the Sacramento study. So this gives us some tentative indications that the shorter, more frequent visits may be a better way to go. I should note there are a number of studies uh, going on right now, particularly over in the United Kingdom, that are looking at this issue in a lot more depth. So I think we'll be soon getting a lot more evidence on the effects of very specific levels of patrol dosage. Uh, but that's what it uh, looks like right now. Finally, with respect to patrol, I just want to offer a few other uh, basic guidelines or uh, considerations for kind of calibrating your daily patrol operations at hotspots. Uh, this is based on some of the other uh, hotspots patrol studies that are available. I think some of that evidence also indicates that having fixed police presence or really extended uh, saturations of the hotspots can sometimes be uh, inefficient and that the uh, shorter uh, stops may be a better way to go. Uh, some of that evidence suggests that daily regularity can be important in enhancing deterrence, so having officers getting those hot spots every day or most days a week uh, can be important. There's also some evidence that uh, the style of patrol that you use at the hot spot uh, can be important and, and can have different sorts of effects. So for example, uh, do you have officers, say, uh, slow roving through the hot spot, you know, combing through uh, uh, the parking lots and the side streets, stopping frequently to type in tags, versus having the officers put themselves in a very visible, prominent location and doing surveillance uh, where they can be easily seen. Uh, there's some research suggesting that the impacts can be different depending on exactly what you're doing. So you may want to think about uh, mixing up a little bit and trying some different strategies and being aware of that. Uh, also, if you have the ability to use, say, license plate readers, this can be a good, uh, these can be good locations uh, to deploy uh, those devices at. There's also some emerging evidence that uh, this approach applies well to suburban areas as well. Most of the studies that have been done to this point have focused on cities, uh, but there, there are a number of studies going on right now that are looking at suburban jurisdictions. Uh, recently, uh, Cynthia and I have done a study with the Fairfax County Police Department in which we found that, first of all, crime was very highly concentrated uh, in that suburban jurisdiction, even more so than in uh, many cities. And we found some preliminary evidence from this study that increasing patrol dosages at those places can also be uh, effective. So I think this is a strategy that has a wide applicability across a number of settings. Okay, so having discussed uh, the use of patrol at hotspots, I also want to talk about the use of problem-oriented policing at hotspots. And Cynthia brought that, uh, that up earlier. I think most of you are pretty familiar with this philosophy that involves careful analysis. Uh, factors that are driving crime and disorder problems and trying to address those underlying factors with a mix of enforcement and non-enforcement techniques and doing regular follow-up assessment. As she mentioned, there's a good deal of evidence uh, indicating that problem-oriented policing uh, is an effective strategy in its own right. Uh, but keep in mind, a number of those good studies that have been done on problem-oriented policing have actually focused on hotspots. So in practice, there's a good deal of overlap between uh, problem solving and hotspots policing. And I want to talk about the use of problem solving at hotspots uh, by way of reference to a study I was involved in recently in Jacksonville, Florida, that involved testing problem solving and directed patrol at hotspots of violent crime. There's a study that I worked on with uh, Jamie Rausch of the Jacksonville, Florida Sheriff's Office. She's the uh, manager of their crime analysis unit. You'll be hearing from her later in the day. Uh, and she and I and others in this study began by identifying 83 violent crime hotspots in the city and assigning them to one of three conditions for a 90-day experiment. Uh, 22 of them were assigned to a problem-oriented policing intervention, 21 to a saturation or directed patrol intervention that involved uh, additional patrol at high-risk days and times, and then 40 of them served as control hotspots where basically it was just business as usual. And so in this study, we wanted to see what the effects would be of each of these strategies relative to business as usual. But we also wanted to have a basis for comparing these strategies to one another uh, to see which one would give uh, the greatest effects. Now, the problem-oriented policing intervention was done by teams of officers and crime analysts who are assigned together to work on these locations. 
Uh, the number of officers assigned to each hotspot varied depending on its size and the nature of its problems. But there was at least one officer working these locations uh, every day. So it was a short-term but intensive intervention. Uh, the officers and the analysts were trained uh, on problem-oriented policing and intelligence-led policing, and they were given the responsibility to identify and try to address the underlying factors that were contributing to crime at these locations and trying to use both enforcement and non-enforcement uh, prevention techniques where possible. Uh, I think the pairing of the officers with crime analysts was a particularly helpful and unique aspect of the project. I think the analysts uh, proved to be very helpful to the officers in studying the crime problems and, and helping to develop uh, solutions uh, to deal with them. The officers engaged in a wide variety of problem-solving activities at these locations. Uh, many of them fell within the category of what we call situational crime prevention measures or SEPTED measures that try to reduce criminal opportunities at those places. So it might have included things like fixing lighting, improving it at certain locations, maybe dealing with building security issues, uh, potentially putting up traffic barriers to reroute traffic through, say, a, a drug market location and the like. Other types of interventions included trying to improve social services around the area, uh, making aesthetic improvements like trying to you know, do types of uh, cleanup activities, uh, code enforcement and nuisance abatement, uh, community organizing work, sometimes targeted investigation and enforcement if there were particular groups of offenders who were causing uh, many of the problems at the location, sometimes working with business owners as well as rental property managers on things like evicting problem tenants uh, and the like. The saturation patrol intervention was done by uh, on-duty and overtime officers who were uh, working these locations during high-risk days and times as determined by crime analysis. Basically, they had pairs of officers who would together work one to three locations for a period that might last for less than an hour to maybe several hours. Uh, incidentally, they were not using 15-minute stops uh, in this particular study. It was a more uh, intensive uh, form of patrol. As you can see there at the bottom, they uh, get engaged in a wide variety of activities at the hotspots, traffic stops, field interviews, other community contacts, uh, and the like. Now, in short, uh, we examined changes in crime during the 90-day intervention period and the 90 days following the intervention. Uh, and we found some indications that the saturation patrols helped to reduce violence during the time uh, that they were in place, maybe up to 20 percent. But those effects decayed quickly once the uh, intervention was over. In contrast, we found that the problem-oriented policing measures reduced violence by 33 percent at those target locations, that effect was apparent in the 90 days following the intervention. So once officers had had an opportunity to diagnose problems and put solutions uh, into place, then they began uh, getting the desired effects. Uh, and in principle, they were larger effects, and in principle, they could be more long-lasting effects, uh, crime prevention impacts. We've done some uh, preliminary analyses also suggesting that uh, some of the more uh, successful problem-solving strategies involve things like nuisance abatement and code enforcement, uh, targeted investigations, and situational crime prevention measures. So those may have been uh, the most effective among the problem-solving activities. As a footnote to this, uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office has continued this strategy. They now have a permanent unit uh, that does this work on an ongoing basis at violent crime hotspots around the city. And you can read about this study also uh, in your packet. There's a couple of short articles. One of them is from Police Chief Magazine. Uh, one of them is from our Translational Criminology Magazine. And they both discuss uh, this study and some of the follow-up efforts that have been done. So I think that this study really underscores the importance of also using problem solving uh, at your hotspots as a way to potentially get larger and longer term crime reductions. So I don't see it as an either or necessarily, but you can think about ways to use the everyday patrol and then to complement that with uh, problem solving measures. Uh, for those of you who are interested in doing more in-depth problem solving at hotspots, I also wanted to mention that uh, we've recently created a tool that can help to facilitate that. This is something that uh, Cynthia and I and other colleagues created as part of the matrix demonstration project. We call it the uh, case of places uh, tool. But it's basically a tool or a methodology for assessing problems at hotspots, uh, diagnosing the crime 
history at the location, the key actors, the social and physical conditions uh, also that are contributing to crime at these locations. And you can use that to develop interventions for these locations and to track the, the impact of those locations. Part of the idea here is that police agencies do a good job of keeping data on people and on incidents, but they don't do a very good job of keeping data on problem places. And in principle, this may be something that uh, could be effective uh, for you. We call it the case of places folder because it's modeled after a traditional detective's case folder. Uh, we actually worked with the Richmond, Virginia Police Department uh, doing this and thank them for their help with that. But we looked at the, the things in a, in a detective's case folder and tried to come up with place-based equivalents uh, for this tool. So as you'll have suspects in a criminal investigation, when you're investigating a place, the suspects may be particular people, but it may also be businesses that are causing problems. It may be, it may be certain types of physical conditions uh, at the location as well. Uh, we also call a case of places, too, uh, with the suggestion that agencies might consider uh, assigning detectives to problem places and having detectives investigate these sorts of locations on a regular basis. But either way, uh, regardless of whether you have patrol officers or detectives doing this, if you're interested in using the tool, it's available at this uh, web link uh, on our website. So finally, I just want to wrap up with a few uh, comments again about what I think is necessary for implementing hotspots policing. One is it's important to have good geographic crime analysis uh, based on both recent and long-term patterns. Of course, you have to respond to the short-term flare-ups that you get on a regular basis, but also be mindful of the long-term patterns with hotspots, that these locations are often chronic over long periods of time. And so I think it's important to, uh, to look at that and get a sense of what your chronic hotspots are. Secondly, think about reorienting everyday patrol around hotspots. Officers are accustomed to thinking in terms of beats, but maybe you can uh, encourage them to think more about the very specific addresses, you know, problem blocks, problem intersections uh, in their patrol areas and have them focus more time on those locations when they're not answering calls for service. We now have a good bit of evidence suggesting that even just doing 15-minute stops at these places throughout the course of a shift can be beneficial. And then in addition, you want to try to complement that with the use of problem solving for larger, potentially longer term crime reductions. When you're doing that, think about both short and long term responses. The short term responses could be different heightened enforcement measures. Uh, the longer term responses could be things, uh, different types of crime prevention measures that you put into place for uh, more long term effects. Uh, Multi-agency uh, efforts can also be particularly effective in this regard, trying to get other government agencies involved sometimes in things like code enforcement and nuisance abatement, uh, getting community partners involved in helping to implement situational crime prevention measures. Those are all things to think about. Uh, and again, part of this goes back to what Cynthia was saying earlier about the effectiveness of tailored interventions, tailoring uh, interventions to, to specific problems or places. And then finally, I would encourage agencies, again, to collect better data on problem places so you can have a better uh, handle on what these places are and what their problems are and so that you can have a better institutional record on the things you've been trying at those places and what, uh, what the impacts were of those efforts. Uh, so that uh, concludes uh, the presentation. Again, uh, thank you all for coming today and hope that will be uh, of help to you. Thanks.